live on WFLA now. With a specialized degree in climate, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist Jeff Berardelli is pioneering the way we look at climate and extreme weather. Welcome to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door. Hey, everybody. Great to see you here today. Now, in today's Climate Classroom, we're talking about something that's very near and dear to us here in the uh, state of Florida. You probably remember it wasn't that long ago. This summer was the hottest summer on record in most of Florida, especially South Florida. And that resulted in an unprecedented marine heat wave. Uh, Heat stress lasted for over 20 weeks in spots, and that was double to triple the previous record. And water temperatures on the reef were about 90 degrees plus at times, even down to the bottom, 20, 30 feet down. We saw a mass bleaching event, a mass fatality event on an already fragile reef tract. Uh, So here to talk more about the situation, I want to bring in Dr. Derek Manzello. Dr. Manzello is the head of NOAA Coral Reef Watch. Uh, I've been following your work. Uh, I know we talked a bunch during the summertime, uh, Dr. Manzello. Uh, Thank you for joining the program. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this was a, a crazy summer. I mean, as a scientist who heads NOAA's Coral Reef Project, uh, project the Coral Reef Watch, um, it must have been even shocking for you to see the the level of, of heat and bleaching that we saw in the Florida Keys this summer. Absolutely. Um, when, when we talk about coral reefs and climate projections, uh, the, the concerns always focus on something called annual severe bleaching. So that occurs at a level of heat stress that we call alert level two. Now this summer heat stress was so severe, we had to add in three additional new alert levels. And the heat stress experienced in Florida was upwards of, as you said, two to three times higher than anything that's been experienced in the past. So what we saw this summer was really a wake up call for the potential that climate change uh, is going to impact Florida's coral reef. And it already is impacting Florida's coral reef. And, you know, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but but 30 years ago, we rarely had coral bleaching. Now we see it every single summer. Of course, this year, right, was by far the worst we've ever seen. Absolutely. So there have been eight mass coral bleaching events since 1987, uh, whereas this event last year was the ninth such event. And again, during the uh, past mass coral bleaching events that have impacted Florida, they generally started in about mid-August. And again, they generally peaked around an alert level two. Now this year, uh, throughout the Florida Keys, uh, the coral reefs experienced an alert level four to five conditions. Now what that means is exactly what you said earlier. We saw upwards of two to three times of bleaching level heat stress that uh, Florida's coral reef has ever experienced before. And this is very concerning because the impact from heat stress that coral reefs experience is a time and dose response. So what we saw in Florida this year was a magnitude of heat stress two to three times higher than ever before. And it also occurred longer than ever before because it started about five to six weeks earlier than we ever saw before. So honestly, it really caught us off guard that temperatures spiked so early this year. Yeah, I mean, I was watching it very closely myself. Now, look, I spent a lot of time on the water. I used to work in Miami. I used to be in the Keys every week or so. I dive, I fish. I'm, I'm a meteorologist, and also I have a degree in climate, so I follow this. This all is very personal to me. Um, you know, up until this year, we had, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but something like less than 5% of the coral reef cover in the Florida Keys, the third biggest reef track in the world, that's all we had left was 5%. Now, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, it was something like 30 or 40%. So we've lost a tremendous amount already. This year, I can only imagine, I mean, do you have any preliminary results, an idea of just how much more we lost this summer because of the mass bleaching event? Um, well, we're still collecting data uh, with partners in the field right now as we speak. Um, and the reason we won't really understand the full impacts of this event for about another six to nine months. And the reason I say that is because What ends up happening in the Caribbean uh, during bleaching events is that a lot of times the corals are able to survive the heat stress, but they get so immunocompromised by being stressed for so long that we always see disease outbreaks in the one to two years following the heat stress event. So the ramifications of this event are still going on right now, even though the heat stress dissipated about three to four months ago. That being said, we already have preliminary data that is very alarming. Now, again, this is preliminary data. We're still collating and collecting all these observations, but 
The elkhorn and staghorn corals, which are threatened under the Endangered Species Act, experienced extreme impacts, especially to nursery and outplant populations. There are reports from the middle and lower Florida Keys, where heat stress was the worst, of upwards of 90 to 100% mortality, with some reefs experiencing complete mortality. The concern right now that I think is most uh, alarming is that we may have just experienced a local extirpation or local extinction of the wild elkhorn populations on Florida's coral reef. Again, these data are still being collected. Divers are still going out. But the mortality incidents that we saw very fast in Florida was shocking. It was a matter of days to weeks in July, once temperatures spiked, that we already started receiving reports of 100% mortality on some reefs. Can I go backwards? Now, I just have to stop you. Did you say a local extinction event? Is that possible? You mean in all the Florida Keys or just on one or two reefs? I know you say that it's preliminary, but but you... You know, I had to go back to that because that's that's an important one. It was staghorn or elkhorn? Elkhorn coral. So it's Acropora palmata is the uh, species name. Now, the reason this is so alarming is that Acropora palmata has been the dominant shallow water reef building coral throughout the entire wider Caribbean, including Florida, for at least the past 250,000 years. Now, digesting that and considering that in one bleaching event, we may have just lost all of the wild uh, elkhorn corals in Florida is really a jarring result. Now the impacts to staghorn coral, which has also been a dominant reef builder in the Caribbean for hundreds and thousands of years, was also severe. However, it does seem that there were some surviving colonies. But again, surveys that are going out, going on right now as we speak are going to be crucial to documenting just how severe this impact was. But the data we already have is unbelievably alarming for what occurred this summer. So Elkhorn, going back to that just one more time, I just want to make sure we're getting this right here. You're saying it's conceivable that at least in the Florida Keys, they may now be functionally extinct or just extinct? So to the, the honest truth is that elkhorn and staghorn corals have pretty much already gone ecologically extinct throughout the entire Caribbean. So their population declines really started plummeting uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s due to white band disease, which is directly linked to higher temperatures. So the populations of these corals have already been, uh, you know, almost on life support in a lot of locations. And, th and these are the species that are primarily focused on for restoration efforts in Florida. And if, if there is a positive to be gleaned is that all the rescue efforts that went on, I mean, it, it was a collaboration between federal, state, uh, local governments and academic researchers to go out and rescue these corals from the ocean because it was just too hot for them to survive. So. If there's any positive spin on this, it's the actions of the restoration community likely salvaged the genetic diversity uh, of uh, Alcorn coral in particular that were lost in, in the wild population. So again, we are dealing with a potential extinction of these coral species from the Florida Keys, but we are still uh, collecting, collecting data. So again, I don't wanna jump the gun, but the impacts have been so severe and in talking with the scientists whose jobs it's been to monitor these wild populations for the past 20 years, their take home message is that this was really, really bad. And we may have just seen an extinction event in Florida. It's uh, unbelievable um, and sad that potentially our children and grandchildren will not be able to experience tropical coral reefs because this is not just happening locally here in the state of Florida. But it's happening all over the world. Uh, of course, climate scientists, uh, you know, generally think that the majority of tropical coral reefs will be gone by the mid-century. Is that correct? So the climate projections do predict that by around 2040 to 2050, all coral reefs on the, on the entire planet will be start experiencing annual severe bleaching. So that is the amount of heat stress that is known to correlate with mortality, uh, in, particularly in sensitive species like, like the stel, uh, staghorn and the elkhorn corals. So around 2040 to 2050, 
It's project. I mean, based on climate projections, and again, conservative climate projections, coral reefs around the planet are going to bleach pretty much every year. And the reason this is so concerning for corals is because when a, a coral bleaches, it's not necessarily a death sentence, right? Corals can recover from bleaching, but what ends up happening is they're essentially starving when they're bleached because the, the algal symbionts provide upwards of 95% of their nutritional requirements. So again, as I said, corals get immunocompromised and they often suffer disease outbreaks, but the lingering effects of bleaching can last for two to four years. So coral calcification rates decline for two to four years, reproductive output declines for about two to four years, which means when a coral bleaches, many of them become sterile and stop reproducing for two to four years. In addition, they become highly susceptible to disease for one to two years. And disease has really been the big killer in the Caribbean uh, for corals because they just, there's so many diseases in the Caribbean for whatever reason, um, and, and they've really just laid waste to many coral populations throughout the entire region, unfortunately. So let's talk a little bit about that. So, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but first of all, there's a lot of stuff going on. We have uh, over nutrient pollution in, in, in the waters. Uh, so that's weakening coral. Uh, potentially, you know, human activities beyond that, direct human activities, maybe just interactions with the reefs. Um, then you have the warm water. So, you know, it, it, and you mentioned it, that these corals are weakened by this climate stress, this heat stress, and they're immunocompromised to the point where when disease does enter the picture, they can't defend themselves anymore. So it's sometimes not just directly a result of climate change in hotter waters, it's a combination of all these things. Essentially, if you have a weakened immune system as a human being, and then a disease comes in, you're going to be much more susceptible to that. So that is, and, it, and nutrient pollution fig, figures into this as well. Is, is that right? Absolutely. So the Caribbean is really, including Florida, when I say Caribbean, is really a unique uh, example of coral reef decline uh, relative to the rest of the world. And again, it's likely due to what you're talking about and that the Caribbean basin is, is very well mixed, um, and, and there's a lot of people that live in the Caribbean basin. So there is a lot of land-based sources of pollution and runoff. And also, I mean, you can see impacts from the Orinoco River uh, causing uh, higher levels of turbid turbidity in places like Puerto Rico. Um, so again, the, the, the geologic evidence, if you look in the geologic record in the Caribbean, you can see negative impacts from humans starting around the time of Columbus which is unbelievable. And again, coral disease has been the real driver of decline in the Caribbean. And many of these diseases are directly linked to climate change, but the most recent disease that popped up in 2014 is something called stony coral tissue loss disease. This popped up right off of Virginia Key, which you and I are both very familiar with, mm -hmm. and has since spread throughout the entire Caribbean. Now this disease alone may have also caused a local extinction of pillar coral from the Florida coral reef. So again, stony coral tissue loss does not have a direct climate uh, link to it as we know right now. In fact, stony coral tissue loss disease actually declines during heat stress, but then bounces back uh, with a vengeance once the heat stress goes away. So as you said, we're seeing a confluence of uh, factors, land-based sources of pollution, overfishing, just overuse of these coral reefs. So when you add in the, the uh, huge threat of climate change, we're taking a already degraded system and we're basically eliminating any chance it has for, for recovery in the long term naturally. That's why restoration efforts are so crucial because we really need to shepherd coral reef ecosystems in Florida and the Caribbean through the next 50 to 60, 70 uh, years if we hope to really maintain uh, the ecological functions that coral reefs bring to humans. So let's be clear. Why are the oceans warming and what do we need to do to stop them from warming? So the oceans are warming uh, because of greenhouse gas emissions, unfortunately. Uh, it's estimated about 90 percent of the warming on planet Earth is occurring in the oceans. So the oceans are acting as a huge heat reservoir. Um, and again, they're, they're warming, uh, you know, lockstep with with the atmosphere. Um, they're essentially just responding to the uh, the greenhouse effect that's occurring uh, more and more every year. You know, that graphic um, we have up right now, Derek, with that alert level in 2023, way up above everything else. And then looking at this map that I took from your a slideshow, that purple in the keys, that's 20 plus weeks of heat stress, stuff that you've never seen before. 
Absolutely. So all those, uh, so to put the and that's purples, your, and by the way, that's your paper that's up there right now, right. which if you want to talk about that as well, I just wanted to let you know and let the folks know why I keep putting it up there. Absolutely. So this is a paper we put out when things, when temperatures caught us off guard a little bit in Florida and the Caribbean and spiked way earlier than we ever anticipated. The next obvious question was, because this is due to El Nino, are we on the cusp of another global coral bleaching event? So the last time there was a severe El Nino from 2015 to 2016, there was a global coral bleaching event that occurred from 2014 to 2017 and actually started in Florida and uh, the Marianas Islands in early 2014. Now, during this global bleaching event for 2014 to 2017, more than 75% of the world's reefs were impacted by ble bleaching level heat stress and more than half of the world's reefs experienced multiple bleaching events. So this one event uh, drove, I believe about an 18% decline in coral cover uh, if you take the average around the entire global reef. So. That was the third global coral bleaching event. The first was on the back of El Nino in 1998. The second was on the back of El Nino in 2010. Third was on the back of El Nino in 2015-16. So the fact that we were shifting into this El Nino state, we got very paranoid and we looked in the data. And again, unfortunately, the data suggests that 2024 is likely to be warmer than 2023. It's already starting seeing, out to be. Exactly. Yeah. So what we're seeing right now is bleaching level heat stress building significantly in the Southwest Indian Ocean. It's likely that bleaching is gonna start in places like Mauritius and Madagascar and the Seychelles in a matter of days to weeks uh, because the heat has already gotten to those levels. And again, heat is starting to build on the Great Barrier Reef. So we're starting to see in the Southern hemisphere what just happened in the Northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And that was really the whole point of the paper. It was to, to say that we're likely on the cusp of the next global bleaching event. And based on all the data we have at our disposal, this is likely going to be worse than what happened in 2015, 2016, unfortunately. But I don't think that's a surprise because, you know, obviously it was during the El Nino, which was a very strong El Nino back in 2015 and 2016. We saw the global bleaching. We're seeing it again now. Um, one thing that I'm always curious about as an atmospheric scientist is, so you have El Nino and that warms the tropical Pacific Oceans. But then why do the other oceans, I mean, I understand the Indian Ocean too, because there's a direct correlate, uh, direct connection between the Indian and Pacific. What is happening in the Atlantic Ocean during an El Nino that would, because it, it, am I wrong in saying that this also happened where it was a little warmer than average uh, during the 2015-2016 El Nino, you know, it kind of taking climate change out of the equation, so just talking about El Nino, I mean... It makes sense that this would be a global bleaching event because of El Nino and let's say the Indian Ocean and especially in the Pacific. But what about the Atlantic? What's going on here? So you're absolutely right. So the Atlantic, uh, it behaves. It, so as you said, the Eastern Pacific and the Indian Ocean behave in lockstep with El Nino. Mm -hmm. So the quintessential El Nino signature is that warm tongue that spreads from you know Ecuador all the way to the central equatorial Pacific. So El Nino impacts in the Caribbean and the Atlantic aren't necessarily one-to-one -one right. with what happens in the Eastern Pacific and the Indian Ocean. It's, it's a lot more complicated, and I believe it has to do with things like the North Atlantic Oscillation and other climate oscillations. Mm -hmm. um, so, again— It's complicated. We it's, it's very complicated, even for an atmospheric scientist or, uh, uh, you know, I assume your background is oceanography or is it marine biology? Marine biology. My, my background is marine biology, yes. It's it's difficult to even understand uh, as, as you know as a re as a research scientist exactly the correlation there, but um, but it becomes it becomes clearer and clearer every year that every time that we have a big El Nino on top of this upward you know linear or somewhat linear trend from climate change. I say somewhat linear because this year we took such a big jump it wasn't even linear. So some of that was El Nino, but some of it wasn't. What happened this year across the world is just uh, head scratching for scientists, but. We know that every time there's an El Nino now, we're going to we're gonna likely, especially a strong one, we're going to see a global bleaching event probably. I mean, am I speaking out of step here? No, essentially that's, that's, that's our big fear. Um, and again, you know, as I said, as scientists, we were concerned about this before we even knew El Nino was starting. Um, but again, you know, you're absolutely 100% right. What happened in the Caribbean this year, I don't want to say it was unexpected, but it was surprising because... We absolutely sounded the alarm for the Eastern Tropical Pacific. I have a lot of colleagues there. It's where I did much of my PhD research. Um, so when the Caribbean started heating up and so fast, it was like, whoa, you know, what is happening? We've never really seen this happen so 
quickly with, with the development of El Nino. Yeah, I remember watching, um, you know, just looking at stuff like that. I mean, you know, Derek, I just want to point out for the folks at home just don't know what they're looking at here. That black line that goes way up to alert level five, all the other lines are every other year. That black line is how much longer the heat stress was because, you know, people looking at this at home it may, may not know exactly what that graphic means, but to someone that follows this closely, it was just shocking, beyond shocking, uh, what we saw. So listen, um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, so I would just say this. Any final thoughts, anything you want the take-home message to be for the folks who are watching this or listening to it right now? Um, well, there's a couple things. Uh, you know, you could kind of relate this to the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think. So the good that has come out of this event is there has been a survival of a lot of the massive and bolder corals. Um, the bad is that we're expecting disease to spike again now and potentially start killing off these survivors. The ugly is really what has happened to the staghorn and the Alcorn corals and, and the shocking ramifications of that. Um, I, I do want to point out very, very quickly, so those purples in that map you showed around Florida, so this was by far the highest heat stress event that's ever impacted the Caribbean. The closest we ever got to what happened this year was what occurred in 2005 in the Caribbean. So the U.S. Virgin Islands experienced heat stress levels that were close to what we're now calling an alert level four. And if you go back to that other plot, you'll see that pretty much the entirety of the Florida Keys experienced those purples, with some locations experiencing the darker purple. So what happened in the U.S. Virgin Islands at that level of heat stress in 2005 was that they saw a 60% decline in coral cover. So the fear here is that we're going to see these levels of decline in Florida. But again, as you mentioned, the Florida coral reef was unfortunately already degraded. Mm -hmm. So if there's any kind of optimism, I feel, it's that I really hope that because these corals have already gone through such an evolutionary bottleneck, that perhaps they're they're hardier and stronger because of it, and we'll see higher survival than we anticipate. It is interesting what you said. I just want to repeat for the viewers here. So we had uh, we having we had major problems with with staghorn and elkhorn. Elkhorn may be extinct now in the Florida Keys, uh, but some of the other types of coral did in fact survive. What was it's hard to believe that they were able to survive. So there is some good news that comes out of this. And I'm just going to say one other thing. The efforts that you scientists are, 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 are putting in to try to save these corals, the repopulations, the growing them in a lab and outplanting them in the water is heroic work. But how can you possibly, if you can possibly, outpace climate change? That's the big question, uh, the big existential question that the coral restoration community is facing, particularly in Florida. Um, and what we saw last year sh totally shows that considering climate change and adaptation moving forward is going to be the key piece. It's like, where do we go from here? And I think the restoration community is doing a real gut check because, as you mentioned, we're looking at a potential scenario where the Florida Keys are going to become inhospitable mm -hmm. to corals in general. Um, but again, I'm, I'm really putting a lot of faith in the fact that we saw a lot of survival from this yeah. event and hoping that that is uh, proof that our worst fears aren't gonna come to fruition. Because as I was watching this develop in July and August, I mean, my fear was we were gonna see a sterilization yes. of the Florida Keys essentially, yep. because it got so darn hot so yep. fast. I thought so, so too. So the fact that we still have live coral out there, and the fact that uh, the restoration community was able to rescue so many corals, this is what really gives me you know, hope for the future. But a year like this must be a year where you've learned so much that the coral community comes together and says, all right, we need to take, we need to change our path, tweak it somehow. Maybe it's not staghorn and elkhorn. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a, maybe it's a more, um, you know, more, uh, uh, some type of different approach, like, you know, assisted evolution or, or something, you know, to allow these, these other corals, maybe they're the ones that we can go forward with in the future. Um, but do you think that these coral restoration, the coral restoration community is going to just change their tactics? Because why bother planting all these corals out in the Keys as soon as there's another year like last year? And you know there's going to be one in the next five or 10 years, something like that. Maybe if it's not 10 years, maybe it's 15 years. But 
Why bother doing that if you know you're going to have to go back out, try, try, give everything you can to get those corals into the lab so that they survive the summer and then put them back out there once the summer is done? Because that's basically what happened this summer. Absolutely. Um, and it, the real challenge here, aside from you know the elephant in the room of climate change, is scale, right? So the scale at which we're doing restoration efforts is just way too small. I mean, we need to, to scale up orders of magnitude, you know, 10 times as much. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, we have learned a lot from this event. Again, so what scientists are finding is that different individuals, different genotypes of coral are better able to survive uh, heat stress than others. So again, you know, drawing an analogy to human beings, you know, we're not all Usain Bolt. We all fall somewhere in the middle of that bell curve. Uh, you know, we're, we're not all Olympic athletes. I'm Same pretty thing fast. <laughs> Same thing. Can, well, I'm not. Same thing can be said. Same thing can be said for corals. You know, there there are some superstar corals, and then there are other corals which you know drop dead at the first uh, sign of heat. Um, so scientists are really trying to understand the genetics of what's causing that. And by understanding those genetics, the the hope is that we can breed corals for the future. So there's a lot of efforts going on in Florida, Hawaii, Australia to do this. But again, the scale is is going to be the big the big challenge um, moving forward. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens here, but um, you know, um, it's just it it just was so unbelievable to watch what what evolved this summer, uh, you know, and I you know with the baseline warming continuing, there's no debate it's going to keep going up the temperatures at least for the next couple of decades. So with that baseline that keeps going up, you know, every time you get you know kind of the right weather conditions and we had the right weather conditions this this summer right stagnant area of high pressure across south florida you know so it was the weather on top of the baseline warming well each one of these events you know could potentially even be worse now it's not going to likely happen next year or the year after it does then we're really in trouble you know because it's you got you need a bunch of stuff to kind of line up together to get something as bad as what we're looking at on the screen right there but um but inevitably we know that what happened last year is going to be an every year event in what a decade or, or more. Uh, all right. So with all that said, Derek, we're, we're out of time. I just want any last words that you want to offer to our audience. Um, I just want to say, you know, Florida's coral reef is in peril and we really all need to be aware of that. And we all need to be taking steps to try to reverse what's happening. Um, and I really appreciate people like you uh, getting this news story out because, you know, we can't stick our heads in the sand anymore. I mean, we're losing, our own coral reef. And in my mind, this is America's coral reef, right? Yeah. Yes, right. This is, this is our, this is our resource. It's our pride and, and joy. It's bad. And it's, it's really a tragedy um, that we need to be aware of and we need to start tackling. I agree. Anybody who's dove the coral reefs has been in the Florida Keys. They know how important they are to the economy, but also just, do we want to lose something that, you know, it's just so beautiful and, and so unique to the state of Florida and the United States. So I totally agree with you. Uh, Dr. Derek Manzella, thank you so much uh, for joining me. I appreciate it. I want to tell you folks at home that you can read more about this uh, and go to links that I've linked to from our article right here on our website. Go to the WFLA website. It should be right there on the front page, but if you can't find it there and you're, you're searching days in, in the future, uh, you can go to the uh, weather tab and then the Jeff's Climate Classroom tab from there, and it should be one of the top uh, articles that you see right there. Again, I want to thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining me. You can listen to this on Spotify. So it's not just on Facebook and it's not just on the WFLA.com website. It's also a, a podcast on Spotify and also on Apple Podcasts as well. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next week again for Jeff's Climate Classroom. Watch or listen to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door on WFLA social media platforms. And find Jeff's Climate Reports on WFLA.com.